Thank you for the introduction and for the invitation to be here today to speak on one of my favorite subjects, which is the challenge of coordinating, or better coordinating, the gas system and the electric system. I took a look at the registration list, and most of you are new to me. You're not really in the FERC world. So I'm going to take this down with a bit of a history uh, perspective on what we're doing and then future challenges. I don't typically title my remarks, but if I did, I'd probably say the gas electric challenge, it's a good challenge to have, but it's still a big challenge going forward. I always have to preface my remarks because I come from an independent commission that I only speak for myself which means that uh, you are free to disagree with me if you wish, but I don't speak for the administration or the agency or the staff or the chair. Uh, it's important to remember as part of an independent commission, the chair of the agency really sets the agenda. In our case, because we're a quasi-judicial organization, when we vote on things, which is typically about five or six times a day on average, it can range from very small rehearing orders to multi-billion dollar pipelines, uh, the chair still needs to get three votes for it. But nevertheless, uh, the agenda in terms of where the agency is going is set by the chair. We have a current chair who's been in office about a year, and we'll have a new chair that takes over the gavel in April, a sitting commissioner right now. So the, the general big topic of gas electric coordination. Uh, what's been happening? Uh, Lately, you've heard a lot more about it, but it's actually been a trend for, if you look at the data, for about 25 years, that we are just plain using more and more natural gas to generate electricity. For those of you who follow it closely, you know that the most efficient use of natural gas is not to boil water and make electricity. Rather, it's a direct usage on um, in industrial, commercial, or residential applications where you're heating air or particularly heating water, much more efficient than generating electricity by boiling water and burning gas. Nevertheless, to me, there are, are, are five trends, that are, are five factors that have accelerated this trend, particularly in the last few years. Uh, the, the first is that, generally speaking, it's easier to build a gas plant than any other type of plant outside of the renewable base. Uh, you're well aware that coal is basically, its prospects for new generation are dim at best under the present circumstances. Nuclear, of course, has issues related to the high capital cost initially, even though the fuel costs are low. And so except for up rates of existing plants and those few plants that are under construction in the southeast in vertically integrated markets, uh, we're really not seeing the nuclear renaissance that we thought we might s see, say, in 2007 when natural gas prices were so high. So number one, it's easier to build a gas plant than it is basically any other type of plant. Uh, secondly, uh, sometimes it's actually electric transmission, which is a more efficient solution to a particular need for power, whether it's trying to resolve congestion issues or enhance reliability. But it is so difficult, frankly, to build electric transmission in this country that sometimes those involved, which is not FERC, we don't, we don't decide, we don't mandate the uh, construction of power plants. That's not our role under federal law. But for either the private developers or perhaps the state regulators who are ordering a utility to build something, they will often go to the default of a new gas plant because it's so much quicker than a potentially more efficient but longer term solution of, of additional electric transmission lines. There's a lot of reasons for that. I can go into them. But the fact is that it sometimes takes the place of a uh, new natural gas plant, or, or a gas plant will take the plant place of what, what logically should have been an expansion of the transmission grid. The third reason that we're using a lot more gas to make electricity is that we need it to back up intermittent renewables, which are becoming a bigger part of the grid, uh, particularly in certain areas, California. Uh, certainly, it's, it's widespread in Hawaii now, for those of you who've watched it. The intermittent nature of wind and solar. Of course, the fuel is free, but you can't count on the wind always blowing. You can't count on the sun always shining. And, and, and particularly in the morning, and more so in California, the evening ramp periods where the sun is setting 
or the sun is rising, but particularly in the evening when the sun is setting, uh, there'll be an enormous need for fast-acting gas plants to make up uh, the difference of lost generation when the sun is going down, and frankly, at the very time people are coming home and demand is up. Only really fast-acting gas plants are in a position to respond to that. So that is a growing trend which will continue to accelerate in the near future. The fourth reason that we're, we're trending this direction is that we have, of course, a domestic supply that was almost unimaginable 10 years ago, thanks to the advances in hydrofracking and horizontal drilling. Uh, I sat on a National Petroleum Council study for two years. It actually concluded about three years ago. And it was a, it was a two year effort uh, focused on oil and gas production in North America. And of course the volume is about that thick if you really want to read it, but the takeaways that I have uh, to distill that two years of work down are number one, North America has an enormous, enormous amount of gas. And number two, the technology will only allow us to find and extract more if we as a society allow that to happen. The point is that we can restrict either places uh, that we're going to extract resources, or we could potentially, I'm not advocating for this, as a society, we could restrict the type of extraction methods, but the bottom line is that we will only find more, we'll only be able to uh, extract it more efficiently. So if you can't tell, I'm obviously bullish on the long-term future of gas in this country. You know, you might like it, you might not, I'm trying to make an observation in terms of how it fits into planning and what we're talking about on this general subject. The fifth reason that we were accelerating more gas, uh, as was alluded to in the introduction, the fact that we have uh, a suite of environmental rules that would range from cooling water intake to how you dispose of coal ash to, of course, the very obvious air uh, regulations that affect not only mercury and air toxics, the rule that's presently being implemented, but of course the clean power plan that's been uh, uh, suggested by the EPA, all of which uh, to some extent are to the disadvantage of more coal production. They're not all exclusively aimed at coal, but for the most part they will accelerate the trend toward basically burning more gas to to boil water and make electricity from that. Uh, again, I'm not putting a value judgment on it. Rather, it's an observation that whether you like it or not, these trend lines have been pretty clear. And to me, they've been particularly clear over the last five years. But the event that really caught my attention and that uh, Develop, uh, that helped generate the concern that I've been expressing over the last few years was the February 2011 outage in the Southwest. You might remember it was right around the Super Bowl that was being held in Dallas. There was uh, un un unseasonably cold weather, but certainly not unprecedented cold weather, uh, affecting Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. And what resulted from that was a, a, a variety of incidents from well freeze-offs to uh, poor communication between the pipelines and the electric utilities. And I believe the, it was about 7 million people in Texas lost power. A uh, good 20,000 meters or 20,000 households in New Mexico lost their pilot lights when it was very cold. Uh, there were outages in Arizona as well. And, and it, was a, it was a big event that had a lot of consequences. And subsequently, our agency, FERC, along with a representative from NERC, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, put out an outstanding report on the causes of it and 34 recommendations, most of which were focused towards state legislatures and state utility commissions. Uh, I think there were six on the electric side, maybe eight, the rest on the gas side. And it was one of those great reports, but it also happened to be released in August of 2011. And you know, for those of you who live in Washington, you know that if you release something in August in Washington, uh, you better have a pretty good rollout plan for people to notice it because a lot of people leave town and their focus is somewhere else. My concern was that this was uh, indicating a series of actions that could be replicated throughout the country as we grew more dependent on natural gas from our traditional, let's say, uh, 
fuels of coal and nuclear. And I'm from the Northwest, so I put hydro in that, but that's not as ubiquitous around the country as it is in the Pacific Northwest. And I was hoping that this was going to generate a national discussion on this growing dependence. Because uh, if you read the report, and I, I certainly recommend you do, because it's a good primer on the gas industry, on the electric industry, and a discussion of what happened, and the recommendations, you realize that uh, these are two very different industries that are converging. They're regulated differently. They're financed differently. Uh, electricity moves at the speed of light. Gas moves through pipelines at 20 to 25 miles an hour. Uh, the production of their, the base fuel is different. Uh, it's, for instance, we have siting authority over natural gas pipelines that cross state lines, but we don't have an equivalent authority on the electric side. So those are cited state by state or county by county. Two very, very different industries, and most of the time people have grown up either on the electric side or on the gas side. Most utilities, with a few exceptions, are either electric utilities or gas utilities, and sometimes the same word means something very different to each industry. And so the concern was that these industries are converging, they don't know each other very well, um, and there are profound implications. When you go from a system where you can rely on a 60 or a 90 day pile of coal, uh, recognizing that sometimes in winter, uh, coal piles do freeze. Uh, when you have a set of fuel rods that only get changed out every 18 or 24 months, that's a very different dynamic than being uh, more reliant on a just-in-time fuel delivery, which is what we are increasingly becoming dependent on as we burn gas to make electricity. That's where the resiliency issues kind of come in. My frustration uh, then manifested itself uh, in a letter that I just kind of put out to the world uh, roughly in February of 2012, uh, almost three years ago, saying, we've got these big issues uh, my concern, based on the outage, I think uh, needs a more thorough discussion of uh, are, is there adequate communication right now? Are there inefficiencies in the fact that the market times of each industry are different throughout the country? Uh, how do we deal with the long-term issues of financing new pipeline to meet these needs? Uh, what should we do about all this? And uh, to his credit, our chairman at the time, once he saw the enormous response that this letter generated, we actually got an official FERC docket number assigned to the letter, and then one of my colleagues added a few more questions. And thus we began what's turned out to be a multi-year effort to further examine this issue and hopefully come to some solutions. Uh, although we've made a lot of progress, we still have a long, long ways to go. The first thing we did, we had five technical conferences focused on the various markets, because if you don't follow this closely, uh, you, you may not realize that we have parts of the country that are in very sophisticated electric markets that involve a day ahead market where you bid in and you may or may not be called based on your economics of your plant, and then a real time market that deals with the real time variations that, are, that differ from what was projected the day before. We also have significant parts of the country, notably the southeast and much of the inland west, which is a typical bilateral market, oftentimes vertically integrated, where the same entity owns, uh, on the electric side, the, the power plant, the lines to, dis to transmit the power, and the lines to distribute the power. That's different than the more what we call the more organized markets, where essentially the generators are in a class by themselves, uh, and compete against each other, and then the load-serving entities actually deliver the power through the transmission and distribution lines. That, you know, that's the way it is, but it does kind of complicate how we would deal with, say, national solutions to this. So we had five regional meetings focused on the different regions of the country. These were held in the summer of 2012. And at, at the risk of potentially uh, offending some people, I would say, that at that time, generally speaking, uh, the pipeline industry uh, didn't really feel that this was a very significant issue. 
And, um, and I'm happy to say that I think that that has changed in the last two and a half years. Uh, my nervousness kind of continued because uh, if you don't count last winter, you may recall that we had two extraordinarily warm winters in a row. And my gut feeling is that we, as a nation and as regulators and as people involved in the industry, we were kind of being lulled into a sense of com uh, complacency because the system wasn't stressed, frankly, um, the, the, the two winters prior to this one. It was, um, <coughs> it was pretty easy to get through. And in addition, a lot of the power plants that are going to be closed down under the mercury and air toxics rule hadn't yet been closed down. Fast forward to uh, last winter, as we were approaching the winter, we, were, uh, we finally came up with a proposal and a rule that said that the pipelines and the people who run these organized markets, which covers most Americans, we made it very clear through the rule that people could talk to each other. It would be voluntary, but if there was some kind of a weather event coming or there was some concern over a sudden loss of a pipeline that was uh, perhaps fueling several power plants, that that communication was allowed, encouraged, and legal. There had been some concern that because of the sometimes the sensitive commercial nature of it, that people could be violating the law by telling an, a market operator that there were pipeline constraints that weren't publicly known. Uh, fortunately, and I will give OMB credit to this, they expedited the effective date of our rules. So instead of a standard 60 day, uh, we cut it down to 30 and it became effective, I think December 23rd of last year, which turned out to be pretty good timing uh, since the polar vortex event number one hit on January 5th and uh, the system was extremely stressed. Uh, there was never a, uh, a, a proposed, uh, nobody lost their power, but it was razor thin close to there being some load shedding when it was extremely cold. Now there were a multitude of factors for that uh, tightness. Yes, some coal uh, uh, piles did freeze and a lot of natural gas plants without proper weatherization didn't work. Some of those plants that had the dual fuel capability of fuel oil found out that because of the temperatures and the lack of perhaps some heating elements, the, the fuel turned to gel and they essentially were inoperable. So there was a lot of the fleet that was down uh, for, for reasons uh, related to those issues I've gone through. There were also a lot of plants that didn't have the gas and they thought that they thought they would because the demand was so high on the direct usage side from local uh, distribution companies. That was a major wake-up call. Uh, there will be ramifications from last winter, including filings before us now that I can't talk about, trying to enhance the reliability of those units that have been uh, part of the capacity markets and are paid to provide capacity. And that's a controversial set of issues that will be debated on paper over the next few months. But my takeaway was that PGM, which operates the biggest uh, market arguably in the world, uh, went into last winter thinking everything was fine. Uh, they actually told us that. And then when they uh, skated through three, it, uh, very tough polar vortex events found out the system was not as robust as as they thought it was and and it has sh shaken a lot of people's faith in the reliability of the system or at least under the status quo in the meantime we've been doing uh, another major effort to try and create uh, more efficiencies in the way these markets operate the gas market starts at 9 a.m. central clock time which is different than when the electric markets start, which are typically a few hours later. There is a natural inefficiency there, particularly based on the present nomination cycles, where sometimes uh, if you own a power plant, you have to, you're bidding into the, the next day market not knowing whether you're going to be called or not. And there's a big question mark as to do you go out and, and and secure a firm supply of gas, not knowing if you're going to use it or not, uh, based solely on when these clock times occur for markets to begin. That is a natural inefficiency. Uh, 
and we propose solving it by moving the gas day to 4 a.m. Central Clock Time, and we, we achieved something remarkable. We, we achieved unanimity in the gas industry. They don't like it <laughs> at all, <laughs> universally. FERC has brought the entire gas industry together in opposition to our proposal. That is a pending rule, so I can talk about it since it's a rule. But there were other elements of the rule, uh, particularly uh, we, we asked the North American Energy Standards Board to take a look at it. They obviously couldn't reach consensus on, the, on when the, the gas day should begin, but they did reach consensus on adding a couple of more nomination cycles to the gas, um, to the gas day, which s should certainly help if they were to be adopted. Uh, something that we'll be considering. Of course, that won't do any good for this winter. That would be toward the future. Kind of the third set of long-term issues which are particularly challenging and all creative ideas uh, will be welcome is how do we finance new pipeline infrastructure? Pipelines have traditionally been financed through long-term contracts with local gas distribution companies. They, of course, must have gas whenever they need it because the, the last thing that they want at all is to lose gas and have to go around manually and relight thousands of pilot lights. So they put a premium on having gas um, and the absolute highest demand time imaginable based on historic and projected usage. So they've been willing to pay basically the, the higher cost of firm supply that has essentially allowed, in many cases, along occasionally with industrial consumers, to, to provide the financing background for new pipes to be expanded. That's traditionally how it's happened for decades and decades in the United States. Gas consumption at the residential level is basically flat. Um, even though customer bases have increased, we have much more efficient um, appliances now that have, despite the growth, led to a relatively, depending on the area, relatively flat demand going forward in terms of gas consumption there. The new customer base, the people who are really using the, the uh, big amounts of, of gas supplies now and more so going forward, are power plants. And yet, most of the power plants are in these markets where they are competitive markets and consumers benefit from the fact that they have to bid in and they may or may not be called based on their bid and their costs. But they're, they're different than the traditional baseload plant that's going to be on 24-7, roughly 365, except for maintenance. And so they are in a position where, where they would argue that it's uh, financially impossible for them to sign 20 and 30 year contracts because they don't know on a day-to-day -day basis whether they're going to run. If they don't run, they're going to get paid. Uh, and yet, this is the group of new customers that, that are requiring a pipeline expansion. So we've got a real conundrum as to how we can get new pipes financed. It's a real issue right now in New England given the fact that they are becoming increasingly, in a relatively short amount of time, 10, 12 years, uh, reliant on gas for electricity. And if you know, essentially they have been, they've been shutting down their fossil plants, uh, the nuclear plants, at least um, Vermont Yankee uh, being shut down, not huge but important from a load pocket and from a cost basis, Nevertheless, it's getting shut down. It adds to the concentration of gas as part of their portfolio mix. The pipes through New England, you know, kind of at the end of the line, are basically fully subscribed. And there's almost universal recognition that new pipeline is needed in New England, uh, more so than anywhere. But, uh, and some of my environmental friends do not agree. They, they want the existing pipeline uh, uh, infrastructure used even more efficiently and are concerned about a 30 or 40 year investment that then will drive policy toward more gas. Nevertheless, almost everybody else admits that this is a real problem. My concern is that if we can't solve it for New England, and I do give credit to the governors for uh, coming up with a solution, although it, it has some challenges related to federal law, at least they came up with a creative solution. But if we can't get it solved in New England, my concern is that this can again be replicated 
both in PJM, perhaps in New York, and certainly in MISO, as the Clean Power Plan has a very aggressive goal, at least in one of the building blocks, of us going to 70% dispatch of natural gas plants. That would require a lot more pipe. And I don't know how we get it financed under the, the present system. So creative ideas are welcome. And that's one that's going to be with us for a while. And, and hopefully there won't be problems uh, before there are solutions. But we're in a very tight situation, particularly over the next couple of years, uh, because of the number of coal plants that will be retired under the mercury rule. And um, you know, if we have mild weather, we can probably get through it OK. But there are different challenges in the winter than there are in the summer. But uh, we're in for kind of a wild ride, I think, for, for about the next 24 months. And I appreciate all of you uh, being attuned to it. We are trying to address it. But hopefully, the context or the substance of my remarks have indicated that there are a lot of different interests here, regulated differently. And the solutions uh, are, are not simple. They may not be elegant. But we're at least giving a good, a good effort. Uh, but uh, these are important matters, and I appreciate everybody being attentive to them and hopefully adding to the discussion in a proactive and positive way. Uh, thank you for your attention. And as appropriate, I will, I will stay for questions and answers. I just have to make is this Oh, it's working already. Wonderful. Uh, first of all, a round of applause. Uh, we definitely want to have some time for Q&A uh, because, uh, you know, the audience here has been predominantly looking at high impact threats of any kind to infrastructure such yeah. as the power grid. So uh, you have more prayer going up on your behalf from this room than probably church, um, <laughs> and, uh, except for maybe the possibility it. of the atheists, you know, who <laughs> get praying when they're really worried about something. Uh, w w I know the concerns here are not only uh, what's happening to all of the issues you've raised about gas and electric interconnections, the loss of coal plants, um, and then you throw a monkey wrench into it like some other kind of disruption to the system by a high impact event. Um, so I know there's a lot of concerns. I'd like to make certain that we have questions from the audience who can identify themselves and raise a succinct question. And I see Mr. Tom Popik has a hand up, but you identify yourself anyway. Hi, Tom Popik, Foundation for Resilient Societies. Uh, on behalf of my group, we'd really like to thank Commissioner Mueller for his extraordinary leadership on this issue, uh, partially due to the interest that uh, FERC, and in this case, NERC, and their good work on this issue, our, our group has been engaged on what is going to be a very important issue going forward. So uh, you spoke uh, to the situation in New England and other places of the country where uh, the home heating gas is under firm contract whereas the electric generation is in the spot market, as right. it might be called. And uh, generators bid into the market if they can uh, secure the gas supply. If they can't secure the gas supply because there's a cold snap, then there may be an outage. But it, it seems that the cost of that outage is really externalized to the society. There is no uh, commercial entity, really, that is uh, held responsible under the current regulatory system. Uh, I wonder if you could comment on that and if there's any uh, alternatives that might produce a greater reliability of, of electricity in these kind of circumstances. Well, thank you for the question and, and thank you for your involvement in this issue. It was in your materials when we visited a while back and I appreciated the attention you gave to it because it does need as widespread attention as possible so that we can come to some better solutions than we have now. Uh, the people who run the markets have basically been trying to address the issue, Tom, by, uh, and I'll speak very generally because we'll have some pending matters before us, but is uh, essentially making sure that if, if you perform when you're called on, uh, you perhaps will get, uh, particularly for overperformance, you will get rewarded. If you do not perform when you're called on, you will be penalized um, quite severely, and the penalties then flow to the, those who did perform. Uh, essentially, not universally, but in a lot of these markets, the capacity is being paid to perform. It's, well, it's a capacity market where essentially the, you know, they're buying an option on you better, we're going to pay you to be there, but then you got to be there when we call you. 
and and that has um, generated a lot of of, of discussion. Uh, you know, that's some of those changes though take several years to implement based on the capacity market design, uh, and so that that has played out in various markets and is in various states of play. Uh, that's part of the solution. Um, hopefully, creative approaches toward uh, essentially firming up gas supply uh, can can come out of all these discussions. I don't know exactly how or how you know exactly how it could be done, but I, I think there's some potential there. Some of the biggest challenges we have are those gas plants that are behind the city gate of a local distribution company, because again. The LDC is going to make absolutely sure they have enough gas for their end-use customers. So that that appears to have been, you know, one set of plants that were particularly vulnerable, vulnerable under the the present system. Uh, in many cases, the the actual generators, in response to what happened last winter, have incorporated dual fuel technology into their plants at great expense, but uh, but worth it to them in the grand scheme of how they're compensated either through a capacity market or through an energy market. And that's a very positive trend. Of course, it's, you, whenever you burn oil, you're very limited, depending on where you are, to, to typically how long you can burn it and how willing the state environmental agency is to give you a flexible permit. But most of those permits are, are limited in the number of hours they can be run each year. But the interesting thing about New England last winter was that uh, oil was in the money a significant part of the time because gas prices were so high. And to maybe add a little exclamation point to my discussion of New England and the lack of capacity, or, or some would argue the need for additional capacity, the highest gas prices in the world are, in, are the futures for the winter months in New England, higher than Japan higher than Asia, that should tell you something. And it's 100 miles away from some of the cheapest gas in the world in the Marcellus Shale. So I hope that highlights the challenge of the opportunity is that we have all this domestic gas, but we've got to find a way to finance the pipeline to get it to the market that is begging for it. That is a tough problem to solve. Um, so all creative ideas welcome. But thank you again for your attention to this subject. And I'll point everybody as to the report that's available on our website where if, if you, you know, you're kind of afraid to ask for a primer on the electric side or the gas side, there's a nice little primer in that report that was issued in August of 2011. We have a question. Identify yourself, please. Commissioner, I'm Frank Gaffney with the Center for Security Policy and the Secure the Grid Coalition. Um, you are obviously addressing a specific issue in your yes. remarks here today. I think many of us in the room are seized with the issue not so much of uh, reliability as resiliency. Yes. And I just wonder if we could take advantage of your being here to hear what you believe the FERC is doing, needs to do, will do, if you can speculate on that score, because uh, just to pick up on a point, one thing that occurs to I think some of us is, wouldn't it be a good idea if you're concerned about resiliency in an environment in which we may really have this upon us as a crisis yes. at any time, not to close these coal-fired plants. And is that something that FERC is going to engage in as an intramural, interagency exercise if, uh, if it is as important as it seems it is from what you've just described in terms of shortages and, uh, and real possible survival problems yeah. for people in a very cold winter? Well, th th this is not going to generate any headlines for people who've been following the things I've been saying and doing on this issue, but m my concern all along, and it's reflected in multiple times in front of Congress, was not what, what the Environmental Protection Agency wanted to do with the Mercury Rule, but rather the timeline in which they implemented it. I, you know, I would have added a couple more years, and I think that would have given us added insurance to get through it. Uh, since a lot of these plants were on the margin anyway, some very old, a lot of them very small. But 
What I try to emphasize, and I'm sure it's to their chagrin, to the EPA, is that the laws of physics will trump anything we write down on paper. So uh, a lot of times, you know, these plants are in locations, and they may not even be of the, soci the size that appears significant, but because they're associated with a particular load pocket, or they provide grid stability in a way of uh, the way that the grid is engineered, they could provide coal plants inertia, which adds to the reliability of the grid that you, know, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't have if you just replaced it with a gas plant. Uh, um, severe concerns about the timing of mats. And we'll see. You know, if we have mild weather, we'll probably get through OK. But uh, what we have done is um, <clears throat> mats has an additional year. We're starting to see the requests come in for essentially that extra year of plants being needed for reliability purposes. But here's the challenge. Those people who own the plants, they have to decide which federal law they're going to violate. Are they going to violate the Clean Air Act or the Federal Power Act? And again, I testified to Congress saying, you really need to fix this so that you don't put the generators in what a former colleague said, the Hobson's choice of which, which law to violate, because you open yourself up to civil litigation. If, uh, if you do that. So we've got a couple in front of us to do that, and we've, we've granted at least one uh, to date. We do have kind of a formal process with EPA on weighing in on the reliability implications, which we did uh, at our last meeting. Uh, the more challenging issue, I think, going forward is the clean power plan, because it is, it is so significant. And in, in my mind, and I've said this publicly, it, it's a challenge that they are trying to fit what I would say the, the square peg of state implementation plans into the round hole of what is interstate commerce. This is a interstate grid, and, um, and, and that is uh, inelegant at best, but potentially very expensive with major reliability implications. And I submitted comments to the EPA on Monday essentially saying that, and uh, you know, it's a, it's a proposed rule, so presumably they will consider changes, but uh, very, very concerned, given how front-loaded the requirements are for 2020. But as I stated in the beginning, uh, these are my views only. Uh, I'm not afraid to share them, but I don't speak for the agency, and whatever agency actions we take will be up to our chair at the time. I have a quick question on uh, the abundance of uh, natural gas, especially in light of uh, fracking. Yes. Um, and one way to bound the problem from a layman's point of view would be something like this, but maybe you'd come up with a better way. All right. So let's say um, uh, all the fracking gas is on the left side of the room and all the other gas is on the right side of the room. And let's say all the normal sources of gas aside from fracking on this side of the room goes away forever. And all we had left was fracking gas only for 100% of our need for natural gas. Mm -hmm. How long would the fracking gas supply last if we used it up as much as we possibly could because there's no other gas, not a whiff of gas anywhere in the world except for fracking gas? How long would that fracking gas supply last if it were the only gas supply available at all? Well, I think we don't know yet because uh, it's a relatively new industry and, uh, and so the profiles of well production are still being formulated, although generally speaking, they, they tend to have a very high initial output that tails off, but probably a very long tail. And a lot of it's going to depend on, uh, depend on, on new areas. For, for instance, California has a significant potential for fracking. And, and gas there, but will it be allowed socially? We don't know that yet. I'd probably make the same argument with New York. Uh, however, in the areas where there are fracking, where there is fracking, the Marcellus numbers have just been unbelievable. And the next wave is the Utica Shale in Ohio, uh, roughly, and the projections there are, are stunning. I, you know, so that be 30 years of, of supply or 50 years of supply? Well, what does that I, mean? There's a lot of, lot of fracking gas out there, and, and there's no reason to believe that the other areas, although they're declining, would go away. 
Plus, we've got the potential of Alaska, which is just enormous. But of course, getting it from the North Slope to other places is the challenge. But um, you know, I, I'm not worried about the gas supply. Uh, I think we've got, you know, like it or not, I mean, I'm not trying to weigh in on being pro-gas or anti-gas. I'm just trying to call it as I see it, which is an enormous Like amount. 100 years or 200 years oh, or 500 uh, years? I, or? You know, I can get you the EIA numbers, there you go. but, okay, great. but that, along that work. something that we don't have to worry about. Our grandchildren won't have to worry about. The grandchildren about. have to. Okay, that's a fair enough. Uh, we have another question. Um, Identify yourself, please, and ask your question. Yes, uh, Terry Hill with the Passive House Institute. Along the lines of the gas, how, how many years? Th there's a tremendous amount of uh, inherent energy embedded in existing buildings. Mm -hmm. Is any thought given to trying to capture that uh, in your plans? Well, um, it, it, there's a lot of effort going on with say, innovative ways to, uh, number one, get building managers to manage energy better. And those are often state programs and sometimes um, privately run programs. Innovative thoughts about how you chill water at night, uh, particularly in the summer, and then take advantage of that cooling uh, during uh, what otherwise would be peak times during the summer. That's really not in our realm other than we have the power in some cases to uh, create market structures where that could be bid in, but it's not something that we would mandate. We, we've been promoting, particularly under our former chairman, demand response, you know, people getting paid to not use electricity. Uh, I've been, always been a supporter of that, but my support's been qualified as to how much you pay. And I was the dissenter on our big order uh, the order would have allowed demand response to be paid the full locational marginal price, just like a power producer. Oh, I argued that you should subtract the cost of generation from that compensation, because otherwise, you know, you've got to pay for the generation to be there. It's not fair for them to not have that backed out. The courts backed me up, but the courts went even farther and said we didn't even have authority in this area under federal law. So now that's being, um, uh, the agency is asking the Supreme Court to look at that. But th that's an area that kind of falls into the demand response in terms of you being able to bid that savings into a market. But for the most part, that's going to be handled at the state level. As Ambassador Cooper comes up and uh, Andrea Boland, I, we have one more question. Please identify yourself. I'm David Bardeen. As I mentioned earlier today, my first civilian government job after I got out of the, the Army was in the predecessor agency to Commissioner Moeller's agency. I joined them in 1958 and worked there for 11 years. I've really got three questions, Commissioner, all related to the authority that your commission now has under Section 215 of the Federal Power Act, which didn't exist when I was there. Uh, first has to do with standards and exceeding standards. You have a complicated process, which I won't go into, in which the FERC approves standards after the national the NERC has recommended standards, perhaps at the request of the FERC, perhaps not. An earlier panel today, we had a former Assistant Secretary of Defense who told us that a number of electric utilities are going well beyond the mandatory standards to do more than the standards require because they feel it's appropriate in terms of their service area, their customers, their sense of mission, whatever. So my first question is whether you as one of the five commissioners feel any discomfort at the idea that one of your elect regulated electric utilities, or ideally many of them, would exceed these minimum standards that the commission sets. No, I wouldn't feel uncomfortable about that. I, I mean, if you take, let's say, you know, one set of security, you know, some areas of the country are, you know, more important financially than others. So uh, perhaps they should exceed standards. Uh, the second question has to do with these high impact risks that we talk about and that yes. you've talked about, um, which is what we've been discussing today and yeah. yesterday uh, in this process, the things like cyber attacks, malevolent attacks 
Uh, maybe a malevolent EMP attack. Maybe not. Maybe just a natural event of space mm -hmm. weather. And there's a question of just information before you get to the question of analysis and what you do about it. And talking with one of the researchers who was here earlier today, but has had to leave, uh, he has a concern that I want to share with you and see whether you have any tentative thoughts on. Uh, the background is this. The Electric Power Research Institute has a data collection program, which I think is wonderful. I believe they have 37 nodes around the country. They and I certainly wish there were a lot more. Uh, they've got the cooperation of some utilities. They work with the NERC's um, geomagnetic um, task force. But the complaint that this researcher was making, and I don't know how valid it is, is that the data that are collected, and this is really empiric data on geomagnetic uh, induced flows in power systems, these data are not being made public, that somebody feels, calls them classified. Hmm. And so my questions to you are, one, has the FERC required anybody in the industry at either of these groups to withhold the data from the public generally and the research community specifically? If it hasn't required it, has it authorized it to explicitly or implicitly by your periodic reviews of the NERC programs? And uh, do you have any personal opinion as one of the five commissioners as to whether such empiric data should be generally available for the research community to dig into, analyze as best they can, and argue about? Well, I'm not aware of us restricting access to that data. I, I, I don't think we've been proactive on that matter at all. Uh, EPRI, as you know, is a member, member organization, so to the extent that it's proprietary data that, you know, they don't feel comfortable or maybe by their bylaws cannot release. Um, I don't know the specific details, but that wouldn't surprise me. Uh, you know, I'll look into it and see what the status is. Sometimes you want this to be public, sometimes you don't, and sometimes you want to make sure the right people have it and uh, so that you know, good decisions can be made, but I'll look into it. That would be great. Commissioner right. Moeller, I can't ask for more, but when Commissioner Moeller says he'll look into it, that means a lot. My final and quick question is this. The natural gas pipeline industry is also a consumer of electricity. Yes. As are the crude oil pipelines and the product pipelines. Yeah. And, and other aspects of the oil industry, the upstream production and the downstream refineries, they can't run without electricity. Has the FERC had occasion to look into the specific questions of reliability, vulnerability, resilience of power, electric power yeah. supply to these other critical energy industries? Well, it's the Southwest outage of 2011, uh, some of the more extreme examples were because of the situation and not enough gas and the need for rolling blackouts, uh, it turned out areas, they had load shedding, blackouts in areas, and didn't realize that, you know, by blacking out this area, they also knocked out the compressor on a gas uh, pipeline, which made, obviously, things work worse. Um, and so that region assures me that they've learned the lessons there. I think we saw, I think we saw something similar with the port polar vortex events that affected most of the eastern interconnection last year. A renewed need to have the electric side understand the gas side so that they wouldn't, um, so that they could designate an, a compressor station as something that, you know, doesn't get blacked out on a rolling blackout and to increase the communication and es essentially identify those critical structures. Has it been a, uh, a massive effort by FERC? No, but I think we've helped add to the, the need for the entities involved to, to actually talk about this and plan for it in the future. So I'm feeling relatively comfortable that through some people's pain, I'll, I'll, lessons were learned. Uh, I appreciate the attention today. I also want to introduce Robert Ivanoskis, who's an attorney on my team. Some of you have worked with him. He's done a lot of these issues. Uh, he's here today. Thank you again for inviting me. Thank you. And, uh